It was your work in Kosovo which actually had a link to the first contact you had from your children. Very definitely. That was pivotal. Because um, my children, most particularly my daughter, was researching me on the internet. She found a way to access the internet and she researched me. And it, it came across as though every time she hit something, it said something about me in Kosovo or working in Kosovo or working for those people. And of course, they were Islamic people for the majority. And that kind of fitted with her memories, her vague memories of me, seemed to be a kinder person than what they'd been led to believe whilst they were held in Malaysia. When that first email came, what did you make of it? I thought it was a hoax. I was wary it might be a hoax because I'd had hoaxes perpetrated before by gung-ho young journalists hoping to make a name for themselves pretending to be my children. And at the same I was hopeful because there was something about it. It just felt right. Were those first emails formal? No, no, very informal. It was surprisingly so. Uh, very much, hello mummy, it is me. It's really, really, really me. How did you prepare yourself for this moment? of reuniting? I should say a really stiff drink, actually. Um, <laughs> with uh, abject terror, but also a lot of hope. Mom. They came through these big wooden doors, flung it open, and this blur of brown came running towards me and just wrapped themselves around me like a limpet and screamed out, Mommy! And it was Shah. And we just, we just held each other 20, 30 minutes, maybe longer, weeping. I could not have told you what she looked like at that moment. I did not even see my daughter's face for all that time. And you know that sound you hear on news footage where a terrible tragedy has happened and you hear people keening in the background? That was us. I could hear these women making this horrendous wailing and I realised it was us and the and a moment the door opened you could see the customs agents over the top of my daughter's head and they were all standing in the corridor with the immigration guys and they were weeping and I was just holding her and I kept saying can I look at you and she kept saying no 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 because I think both of us actually thought that we might disappear if we let go and um it was like having a newborn baby all over again, except she was bloody huge, enormous, huge. Shahira finally made it home on the 1st of April 2006. When all dust had settled, we managed to go up and have an amazing family Easter. This is the most I've ever had. And it was wonderful, absolutely brilliant. And then a couple of months after that, we had Shah's 21st. For the first time in 14 years, I was able to make her birthday cake. As a surprise, the children organised Eden walking in on me and almost fainted. And I just had the most wonderful thing that night, was cooking a meal for all my four children. And everything was okay. All the kids love each other to the point of suffocation. You are the sum total of the family who loves you. My family, they're the essence of what's important and my greatest joy. My life now is chaotically simple, um, but it just revolves around the children. Cooking, meals, and I'm shattered. Being an older mum the second time around, but all that aside, life is just blissful. All right, done. I've recently released a new book and that's been translated into the 22nd language, including Russia. So I'm always getting very strange requests from translators now. This is a Dutch journalist wanting to know all these, this enormous list of questions. This is to coincide with the release of my second book in Holland. But writing is my biggest joy. It's, it's what I do for me. Jacqueline has been a high-profile international lobbyist on human rights and refugee issues, and in recognition of this work, she was appointed to a new role as a patron of CARE International. Won't you please make her very welcome up here to the stage tonight, Jacqueline. I get asked to do a lot of public speaking, probably a speech or an address 
about once a week and I travel all around Australia speaking and overseas. We are defined by the people who want to be with us when we're at our worst or we're defined by the people who say, that person helped me or, oh gee, she made a difference and they in turn pass that on to someone else. So as you reflect back, what, what's weighed on you? What's shaped you more than anything else? I'm not sure. Perhaps my adaptability. I've never been asked that before. Maybe my adaptability and possibly, I hope to a certain extent, my ability to learn empathy to actually take what I've learned and try and put myself in someone else's place and try and help them from that. Jack, thanks for talking to us. Thank you.